what I'm going to do first is make a new layer for the line art, and I'm going to right click that layer, convert to frame by frame animation, and keyframe every other frame. So that is going to allow me to animate on the twos. I'm animating at 24 frames per second, but animating on the twos basically each frame lasts for two frames, so it's more like animating on 12 frames per second, but still at 24. So, to start the line art, uh, usually, for personal preference, I usually like to start with uh, the nose. So I'm going to start by drawing that in. So I'm just following my outline very closely and drawing in the nose on each frame. Okay. So I play it back and see how it looks. And it's looking pretty solid. But I'm going to add a little bit more of an arc to the animation at the end. Arcs is one of the animation principles of the 12 principles of animation. Basically it just means that uh, parts of animations move in sort of like a an arc motion or path. So I'm going to move these noses out. A little more so that like their path is sort of making like this curve shape as opposed to being more linear it just makes it feel a little bit more natural even though it's a really subtle change so now next i will be moving on to animating the mouth and lip sync lip sync is something that comes pretty naturally to me with uh, all the experience and practice that i have but I know that some people do struggle with it, and basically, you're really just going to want to just mimic the mouth shapes, and the best advice I could give to someone struggling would just be to make, make those mouth shapes yourself, see what shapes your mouth is making when you are pronouncing whatever words you're animating to, and sort of just mock that shape in the mouth that you're drawing. And just make sure that everything obviously syncs up to that audio. So the audio for this segment is because that's the tempo that'll go. So I start with making the k, the C sound with like the mouth shape on the first frame here. And then we got the uh, he's going to be saying cuz. So that's the shape of the second frame. And then the z, the S kind of sound. Is always going to be like a closed mouth with the teeth showing, of course. The uh sound is always going to have like that open mouth. So that's usually the mouth shape for like an E or an A kind of sound. And the T, when he's making the T sound for the, also going to be a closed mouth shape, sort of like the S. And M sound is just like a closed mouth. And so is a P sound, so. And then of course the O sound is just like a small uh open mouth, but like, you know, like making an O sound. And the L shape is always going to have the tongue sort of present in the mouth shape. And sorry if I'm sort of stating the obvious here. This is more for anyone who is more of a beginner or struggles with lip sync. So give them sort of a guideline of what to do to animate lip sync. And now that this is done, obviously you're going to want to play the animation with the audio to see if everything syncs up and looks correct. And I'm just gonna add the snout shape on some of the earlier frames because I did not add them. And then I'm just gonna add some more details like lines and the teeth and stuff. Okay, from here I will usually next 
drawn the eyes. So again, I'll be sticking close to that outline I initially made and just drawing the eyes on every frame. I'm just making sure that the eyes follow the movement of the head. And I'll usually draw out the outlines of the eyes and then add the pupils in just to make sure that the motion looks right on the eyes before getting into the details. And then next I will be adding in the pupils. Okay, and next I'm going to add the eyebrows. I like to add these diamond-shaped eyebrows. However, that's a completely stylistic choice. Um, it's just because I like the way it looks aesthetically, but I mean, most of the time they're drawn as circles in most art styles, or you can draw like more human-like eyebrows, but this is just how I do it or how I'm doing it in this particular animation style. And for this, I'm mainly just kind of eyeballing it. Uh, obviously, this wasn't included in my outline. So I just rely on onion skin and just following the motion of the head and drawing in each brow. Once I've finished drawing out those brows, next I like to draw in the head shape and what I do for that I when I'm drawing the head shape I do not draw any of the details like ears hair or like the cheek fluff yet I'm basically just making sure that the head shape is consistent throughout the animation and without any of those variables like the ears just to make sure that everything's really solid underneath structurally before adding in those details which I'm going to be animating straight ahead. So what that ends up looking like is basically like a bald head and it looks kind of funny especially without the ears and stuff but it's a uh, basically like I said it's just to get the structure down the initial structure of the head make sure everything's consistent before adding in the details. So I'm just drawing the lines in for the head on each individual frame, trying to keep the shape and size consistent throughout. However, there's a trick I'll show you in a bit that allows me to make sure the head is the same size on each frame. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the little trick that I use to keep the head sizes consistent. What I will do is go to the first frame. I'll make a new layer underneath it, and I will make an ellipse circle shape. And I'll make it a lighter color so you can see the lines. I put it underneath the head and make sure that it's about the same size as the head on the first frame. So now I will go through each frame and compare the head line art to that circle shape and make adjustments to the headline art as necessary. So these first few frames look okay, size-wise. And this one might be a little small, so I'll like enlarge it. Or if a head looks a little bit too big, can make it a bit smaller. Just to really make sure that each of the head shapes, or rather the head sizes, stay consistent throughout the animation and are not like getting bigger or smaller when it's meant to be the same size. And I'll just keep doing that to each of the frames until I get to the end of the animation. And like I said, it looks a little bit weird right now, just because there's no like ears. The bald head looks kind of funny, but next I'm going to be adding the ears, so hopefully it won't look as weird and funny, and I'll start looking better. So again, I'm going to keyframe every other frame, and then I'll be starting to add the ears in. And for when I animate, 
I like to separate a lot of the parts onto different layers. You can see I drew all the face layers onto one, but um, for separate parts, especially like ears, fluff, and other parts like that, I'll animate them on a different layer so I can focus on just animating that one part at a time, and if I make a mistake, I can just erase it without erasing like the parts of the head. And usually I'll also line them in a different color just to keep things separate and organized. So yeah, and you'll see later on, but after I line the individual parts, I will go in and erase the underlying overlapping lines and keeping each uh, part separate on different layers allows me to just erase um, underneath the lines. Um, by locking each layer and without erasing some of the other lines, and you'll see that more clearly later on. But I'm gonna add the ears now. My character is a hyena, so it has sort of these kind of shapes for the ears. So I initially draw the ears on one frame. So for animating ears, basically you want to animate them obviously following the movement of the head, but you're going to account for drag. So, for the second frame, the head isn't moving too much. So I'm mainly going to draw them mostly in place, but slightly moving depending on which way the head is going. And this one is starting to drag a little bit, the further away here. So the base is moving with the head, but the tip is sort of starting to drag a little bit behind. Sometimes what I like to do is animate one of the ears all the way through, and then go back to the other ear. So here we have our first dramatic shift of the head. The head is rotating one direction. So what I'm going to do is draw the base of the ear being pulled in that direction. But see how the tip of the ear remains in the place that it was? That's going to cause it to drag from that. So it's sort of dragging behind the animation. And follow through. It's going to keep going. The tip is sort of still dragging behind. And the head is still rotating, so it's still coming down. Still coming down. And then it's dragging some more. This is sort of the motion that you animate the ear. It's sort of hard to explain in words, but basically you just want to be keeping the base of the ear with the head, but the, the tip is sort of moving behind it, if that makes sense, or dragging. And then I'm going to revisit the other ear. And the head is going to Hold the ear in this direction, and then the ear sort of just keeps going. Basically the tip is going to kind of leave off where it was in the last frame, but the base of the ear always just following. Okay, I think that's looking pretty good, so usually after that I will start adding in the details of the ears, so I'll be drawing the rims and the opening of the inside of the ear, and then I'll add some fluff in there as well. I usually like to, I usually like to use a thinner brush for the inner ears. So I'm just going to be outlining the inner ears and just making sure that it's consistent with how the ears are moving. Alrighty, I got the inner ears outlined, and so now I'm going to add some little fluff tufts inside the ears.
And then I'll do the same thing for the second ear. I animate fluff very similarly to ears. That fluff is going to drag behind in the animation. I'm just sort of following the path. And it does follow like an arc kind of path, it just depends on what direction the head is moving. Next I'm going to do the rough fluff, the cheek fluff, and I'm going to do that on another layer. So I draw them on the first frame, usually I like to follow one side all the way through and then go to the other side, like the ears. So basically, like any secondary action kind of things, like the ears, the fluff, it's going to follow the same kind of path, same kind of animation. If the head isn't moving much, the tufts don't really move that much. But I always redraw each frame because it's going to look smoother and more organic. So now the head's moving slightly, so I'll move them slightly in the direction the head is moving. Now the head is moving drastically, so basically it's kind of like inertia, like the tips keep moving but they're also being dragged. So the tips are like continuing in that direction the head was moving, but now the head is also pulling it this way. So again, there's that concept of drag. Still being pulled. And now they're sort of straightening out. And they're being pulled this way. And again, the tips keep moving. And there we go. Next I'll be outlining the other fluff. Kind of doing the same thing. Not worrying about any overlapping lines right now because they're going to be erased later on. But it's still it was still good of me to draw out the entire head shape because it acts as a as sort of a guide on where to place, you know, the cheek tufts and the ears and all that. And this looks pretty good. And next I'm going to be drawing the hands, the hand paws, the arms, the shoulders, that kind of part. So as usual I'm going to just keyframe every other frame and start drawing in those details. Again, just following the outline pretty closely. Alrighty, so I aligned the hands and arms. Next, I'm going to add some details like claws and paw pads. And for the claws, I do a similar trick to what I showed you with the ear fluff. I outline them in a different color, and then any overlapping lines I'm able to delete right on that same layer based on the way that my animation program does lines and stuff, so it's pretty convenient that I'm just able to delete any inner lines that is overlapping with a different color. So let's go ahead and add some claws and pop hats. And now I'm going to erase the inside lines like I was talking about. And next I'm going to be adding the neck and shoulders and the torso details. And now I'm going to add some chest fluff, and I'm going to be adding it to one of the other fluff layers. And lastly, I'm going to be adding the hair 
animation. And the hair all animates very similarly to just another tuft of fluff, sort of swinging around with the head and dragging when necessary. And I'm pretty satisfied with that hair. I just realized I forgot to put in the paw pads, so I'm going to do that and then we'll clean up the lines. And now to cleaning up the lines. What I do for that, since everything's separated on different layers, as you can see there's overlapping lines like underneath the hair, etc. What I'm going to do is lock all the layers except for the one underneath that is overlapping and I'm going to erase those overlapping lines while the other layers are locked so that those don't get erased at the same time. So you'll see what I mean in a sec here. Basically, uh, usually I'll start with the head layer. That one always has the most that's overlapping and needs to be erased. Clean up. So I will unlock that layer with all the other layers locked and erase the head layers, the line art where it's overlapping something that is covering those lines, such as the hair. And so, basically, that's just my cleanup process. Erasing any overlapping lines, a lot of the underlying head layers, a lot of it does end up getting erased. And you can look at it as wasted time or work, but it's still very important that I draw the full bald head underneath because it really does provide that structure and guide for me when I'm placing the other elements like the ears and the fluff. So it's still worth that extra effort even if I do end up erasing a lot of it. I'm going to start erasing some of the ears. A lot of times it will be covered by some of the hair, so I'm going to erase anything that's overlapping that shouldn't be. And that's everything that's overlapping, so the liner is all cleaned up. And what I do now, what I do next is I'm just going to make all the lines black. And now the line art is pretty much finished. Next we're going to be moving into color. So because everything is split into multiple layers here, what I have to do is make a new layer underneath all my other layers. and. I'm going to merge down my liner onto one layer, and this is going to be my color layer. Basically, this makes sure that everything is close shape, and I'm able to add color inside those shapes. So again, I'm going to keyframe every other frame, and then just copy all the layers, and then paste them in place on the layer underneath. And I'm just going to keep doing that for every layer until all my liner is merged down. Alrighty, now all my liner layers are merged down. I'm gonna want to lock all the layers above so I can just focus on the under layer, which is going to be my color layer. Obviously you're gonna want to have a reference sheet of the character you're coloring. I've got one right here. So my coloring process usually goes like this. I will probably completely color the first frame and then I will I'll demonstrate how I do this but I kind of outline the lines of the markings and then color them in. So like I said I'm going to start by coloring completely coloring the very first frame. Alrighty, now I have this first frame colored in, and usually I have sort of a, a set process or an order that I like to color this character in. Usually I will start with the little mole markings on the side, just using onion skin to, as my guide to seeing where I would place this marking on each frame. Alright, usually then I'll outline the yellow markings for the snout and the face. So, usually I will just start by 
just outlining where the markings are before filling in like, the whole color. And then I'll continue to outline the rest of the markings before starting to color them in. And once I have outlined all the markings, I can go ahead and fill in each block of color. Coloring is pretty straightforward, it's just a little bit tedious, especially if you have a more complex character. So in the meantime, I might answer some frequently asked questions I get. The one I get asked the most is what program I use. That would be Adobe Animate. Adobe Animate is not free. It comes with my Adobe Creative Cloud subscription. And I'm gonna have to look up how much it is for individually for Adobe Animate, but I could probably put it on the screen. A lot of people also ask me what I use to draw. For whatever reason, some people seem to think that I draw with a mouse for some reason. People ask me that a lot, but no, I do not draw with a mouse. I use a an XP pen tablet. I won this from winning the ghost meme competition. And otherwise, I also use a MacBook Air laptop. I get asked how long I've been animating. I have 11 years of experience. I started back on a flip note for the Nintendo DSi back in 2011. And that's where I fell in love with the medium. And I've really been into animation ever since. This character that I'm animating here is named Boomer. He's the star of the Balloons animation meme that I just put out recently. Boomer is a hyena. And he's actually named after a place I used to go to as a kid that's basically like Chuck E. Cheese's. But it was called Boomer's. There was basically like an arcade and a kitty play place and stuff like that. And so he's named after that. Boomer doesn't really have much of a backstory, but he does have a personality, and that's that he's pretty much a big partier. He likes parties and raves and stuff like that. He's very energetic, peppy, confident. So, because he's a big partier, I thought he would be absolutely perfect to animate for the Balloons meme, because his personality just fits really well. And that's it. It is all colored now. And it is all done. Aside, of course, from the background, which I will be adding later on. <laughs>